myself, I have been in Malaysia for going on 12, 13, 14 years. And I put in quite a lot of effort in teaching and traveling all over Malaysia and this region, in fact. And I've given, well, I've given about 30 years of my life to the Dharma. Because I'm 42, so I started doing practices and, and getting initiations and taking refuge and all that when I was already in my early teens. So around 10, 12, 13, around that age. So I myself um, left home when I was around 15 and I joined another Dharma Center when I was 15 in Los Angeles and from there I went to India and from there I came here and my point is the last 30 years of my life has been given completely to Dharma so I have not pursued uh, anything really for myself uh, all my life so outwardly I look quite normal which I am untamed um, not fitting the role of a teacher, the physical appearance, and um, quite outspoken, and everything about me bespokes non-dharma teacher. But although on the outside I'm quite like this, I'm actually quite conservative. Deep down inside, I'm very, very conservative. When it comes down to dharma, when it comes down to prayers and teachings and procedures and all that, I don't deviate. Uh, and the reason for that, that I don't deviate, is because um, I have learned the traditions of Gandhian Monastery from the holy masters and the monks and the teachers there that's been passed down for centuries. And those were passed down for thousands of years. So I am in no position or authority to come and just change the teachings around or change the procedures around, change the prayers around and twist it back and forth. I wouldn't dare do anything like that. And also another thing is that one of my teachers in the past would tell me all the time, you're too conservative, you're too, you're too narrow and tight. You should be a little more easygoing and a little more uh, loose because you're not with Tibetan people, you're with outsiders who don't know anything. And so uh, because of these two, over the years I've evolved into what I am now. For some of you, the word evolve is a verb that evokes uh, betterment. So uh, for myself, evolve means to be more able to reach out to the people who are non-Tibetan not Tibetan, or not from a Buddhist Tibetan background. Because if we bring all this Tibetan conservatism outside of Tibet, uh, some people will like it, but most people will find it difficult and uh, maybe even uh, over-challenging. So what I've done is over the years I've challenged my, I'm, I've evolved myself to fit the appearance, the look, the talk, the jokes, the playing, the culture, what people like, their attractions, what they're not attracted to. I kind of tried to understand better and better and better. It wasn't that hard in order that the Dharma message can be conveyed, but in such a manner that most people will be comfortable with. Most people. And so that's one thing. And the second thing is I've observed that in this region, not all over the world, in this region, that a lot of educated people and younger people and people who tend to have a lot of exposure and a lot of experience tend to find Buddhism somewhat dated, backwards, tight, traditional, and associated with a certain strata of people. So I find that wrong, because I find that Buddhism actually is exactly the opposite. Because when we go to Western countries, Australia and Europe, not Asia, we find that a lot of progressive, powerful uh, people who are educated, especially scientists and professors, they're very, very much attracted to Buddhism. But it's the opposite phenomenon in the East. In the East, it's more like, oh, um, Buddhism is not very progressive, and it's associated with a different strata of people, different type of people, and you have to understand, there's no higher or lower or better or worse or right or wrong. It's just a different strata of people. And I noticed that when I travel all over. And one that was predominantly very strong is when I was in Singapore, I saw that, where a lot of educated, I mean, everybody in Singapore is basically educated, the new generation, and exposed. And there was this kind of, well, you know, Buddhism is taught to do this, 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 and this, and that's it. And what is the meaning behind all that? 
So I found that quite challenging, and over the years I've evolved myself into someone who actually would like to fit in with everybody. Look the part, be the part, experience the part, and at the same time, thanks, at the same time, still be uh, authentic. And that's one. The second thing is I want to break through this thinking that Buddhism only suits a certain strata of people or a certain level of people. I want to break through that. And what I want to break through is to let people know that Buddhism does suit everyone, but instead of asking the public to change their view or change their outlook or to change their thinking or to change their um, projections immediately, I was thinking that the Dharma teacher should do that. If the Dharma teachers take responsibility to change their outlook, change their appearance, change their approach, change their method, I think the Dharma reach farther and farther and farther. And so, for myself, I like chanting. I like retreats tremendously. I love retreats. I like to be in solitary retreat away from everything. I can do it for years. I don't mind because um, I don't know. It's just in me. And I like uh, the conservative type of Buddhism. I, I adore non-conservative teachers like Chugim Chungba and Lama Yeshi because they were really, really non-conservative and they were really they did things that other monks or teachers wouldn't even whisper. They did. So my point is, I admire them. But that's not really my style um, because I'm more conservative. So my point is this: is that, but to get Buddhism across to a wider field, a greater spectrum, a, a, a generation of people, I think that Dharma teachers, in my case, I can't speak for other people, must present it in such a way that these people will be attracted to it. Hence the appearance, hence the jokes, hence the teasing. Hence the gifts, hence the activities and style, everything is to be geared toward people who ordinarily would not even think about spiritual practice or Buddhist practice. And my brand of Buddhism is give the message, not the culture, my culture. Give the message, but not the narrow thinking. You cannot, can, can, this way, that way, this way, that way. Also, my brand of Buddhism is acceptance. As you are, who you are, whatever you like, whatever your preference, whatever your culture, whatever your background, whatever your inclination, remain as you are. But just take Buddhism inside of you and practice. And also, another thing I like is that my brand of Buddhism is that your interests, artistic, professional, friend-wise, whatever it is, to keep your interests alive and as it is. Of course, the beneficial ones. And to spread this type of Buddhism. And also my brand is that you should wash, you should clean, you should groom, you should look good, you should be attractive. Why? Everybody feels good when they're clean and groomed and attractive. We can't have a brand of Buddhism that says, hey, you know, let go of everything and just look like trash and smell like trash and uh, pretend you're renounced and pretend that you're all not attached. And that's not true because we are attached. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean we, we can pretend to let go of everything or not. So what happens is my brand of Buddhism is more fit in with the people, understand their culture, teach a brand of Buddhism that is in their language. Language doesn't necessarily mean English or Chinese. Language meaning their kind of thinking. But convey the essence of Buddhism to them. And also my brand of Buddhism is not, for most of you, you're not going to be Dharma teachers. So my, my brand of Buddhism is to teach you the principles, the basics, the fundamentals, the practice, and lead you to a higher level, but something that is very applicable in your daily life. Something that when you come across difficulties and problems and sufferings and, and you know challenges, you can apply the teachings and say, oh, now I can use the teachings for the benefit. Because ultimately, whatever religion you're in, Ultimately, whatever practice or meditation you're doing, or whatever sect, or whatever non-religion you're in, whatever it is, religion can't take away your problems. Religion can't solve your problems. Religious teachers and deities and Buddhas and all that 
cannot solve your problems. I don't care no matter what people say. Oh, you know, um, if I pray, it'll be like that. If I pray, God will do this for me. If I pray, Buddha will do this for me. Well, why is it that they're selective in who they do it for and how and how long? And if Buddha and God and all that had the actual power to do all this, then there should not be any suffering or problems or even the word suffering in the world. So am I criticizing God and Buddha? No. I'm telling you to use your mind with the evidence I'm giving you what really spiritual practice is. Spiritual practice is not the elimination of problems. Spiritual practice is not the elimination of difficult or ugly or challenging circumstances. Spiritual practice is the attitude we take when those situations arise. Spiritual practice is the attitude that we take when difficult, challenging, unpleasant situations arise. Why? Whatever religion we're in, those situations arise. Whatever God or Yidam or sect we belong to, those situations arise. Even some of us are not even religious or not religiously inclined for those problems that religious people experience and non-religious people experience are exactly the same. So what's my point? My point is, why is it religious and non-religious problem, problems arise for religious and non-religious people? Why? So therefore, if we use religion to remove the problem, we will be very disappointed. And that's what I call a wrong projection. A wrong projection. So what I want to make clear to the people here, who are close and smart and educated, and who can think, who can think, you're not villagers, who you're told what to do. But I like to give you information for you to think and apply to different situations. And that is, religion is meant to help you change your attitude when those challenging, difficult, nasty, ugly, difficult situations arise. One who is spiritually advanced, one who is spiritually learned, one who is spiritually practiced, it's not the outlook. One who is spiritually advanced or practiced when difficulties arise, their mind doesn't change. Their goals do not stop. They do not get discouraged and they do not give up. And in times of trouble, instead of being dragged down and looking for comfort, they become the ones that comfort others. So if we keep looking for religion as a method to remove our problems, and difficulties, then we are in religion for the wrong reason, and for that very reason, we will become disappointed. So you've heard many times in your life people say, oh, you know, I went to a temple, it didn't work, I don't go anymore. Oh, I was in this religion and I prayed, it didn't work, I converted. Oh, I'm not going to practice anymore, I'm not going to do it anymore. We've heard that many, many times, and then they say, why like that? Well, the answer is very simple. Religion, any religion, and I say this with respect to other religions that I don't know much about, but human problems in every religion is the same, that's what I observe. Religion cannot remove problems. Religion cannot change people. Religion cannot change difficulties and disasters and, 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 and ugliness. It cannot change. But religion, through time, understanding, and learning, can change our attitude. When it changes our attitude, then our difficult people that we have to deal with are easier to difficult, uh, uh, deal with. And they are not as difficult as we see anymore. You see, they didn't change. Their difficult nature, their difficult background, their uncooperativeness, their stubbornness didn't change. But we changed. We changed. So why is that beneficial? Because we always go asking and pointing fingers and saying, why he's like that? Why she's like that? Why they like that? Why they're like that? And then we get upset and depressed. Oh, my girlfriend left me and that's why I want to commit suicide. Oh, my boyfriend left me and that's why I'm very unhappy. So we always say 
point at problems from other people. Oh, my mother's like that, and that's why I'm like this. Oh, my father's like that, that's why I'm like this. Oh, my country's like that, that's why I'm like this. You know, they're like that, that's why I'm like this. So people like to blame other people. And what we need to change is not tell people to give them magic or numbers or mantras to change other people. That's impossible. But to change ourselves. Once we change our view, once we change our view, then the people that are difficult has a higher chance of changing. And if they don't change, they can't disturb us. For example, if we ourselves have tuberculosis, if we ourselves have tuberculosis, because that's rampant in India, where we come from, is it more logical to have everybody in the world quarantine where we go? or to quarantine ourselves. I have to think. So if it's like that for a physical disease, for a mental disease, it's also the same. If we have anger, is it more smarter to keep people that might provoke our anger up away or to transform our own anger so that even people who can provoke us, if they come near us enough, they cannot disturb us anymore. So if we have a physical problem, or we have a mental problem, a problem is a problem. So if we have anger, if we have anger, and we want to always push people away, or keep people away, or, or narrow people away, or kind of put them in a box where they upset me, so I don't want to deal with them, I don't want to be with them, and that will be a good excuse, I find that that's not a very pervasive answer. It's not an answer that solves everything. So I think that for people who are angersome, it will be better to learn about anger, understand about anger and its benefits and disbenefits, and perhaps the it. When I say benefit, because some people think there are benefits to anger. Vajra anger, or higher anger there is, but normal anger like us, there isn't really. So my point is, we have to meditate on the disbenefits of anger, how it can be removed, where it comes from, how it manifests, how it survives. You see, in Buddhism, how a negative emotion survives is very, very powerful in removing it. Because we have the emotion, but how does it survive? If we had tuberculosis, just curing the tuberculosis is very good, but we have to find out how it sustains and survives. How does this virus or this disease exist? If we can exist, find out its existence, we can remove it, eradicate it completely. Similarly, so therefore, what I'm trying to say is, religion, if applied correctly, can change our view and perspective about everything around us. And when that changes, it's as if a miracle occurred. It is as if a miracle occurred. And in today's world where water is very easy, medication and hospitalization and medical care is very easy, Getting money is basically very easy because we're not an agricultural society anymore, at least in this country. And, and, and living and comfort and air conditioning and protection from the elements is quite easy. So physical conditions to live has become very easy. But our mental condition to be happy is not easy. It hasn't been easy. And in fact, I think in this day and age it's become much more difficult. So today, opposite of what people think, because they don't know yet, religion plays an even more important part in creating happiness for the modern person. Modern is not old or young, it means people living in this day and age. Why? Because modern conveniences are so easy, communication is so easy, but we are not any happier. We are not any better. In fact, the world is even more fighting, distraught, problems, many types of problems on many levels. You know, world, you know, destruction of the environment and, and global warming, all that. All that is very, very damaging, but if we think carefully, it arises from a selfish mind. All of that arose from one or two persons' selfish mind. And the selfish mind was able to manifest. One, the problems we have in the world arose from one or two persons' anger, or bias, or prejudice, or, or um, sectarianness, views. And it spread like wildfire. Because once one person brings it out, other people feel the same and manifest. But we have to do the opposite. If one person can create wars, global warming, 
and all types of disasters in the world, I think one person or two person developing compassion and tolerance can also spread in the world. Definitely. Why? It all comes from the mind. So therefore, therefore, it's much easier to act out anger and hatred and revenge. It's much more easier. Why? Because many of us would like to believe that we're weak. When we are weak, we act out negative actions. But actually, we're not weak. We're quite strong. So my point is, we sh today, it's even more vital that we have a religious discipline. And in our case, Buddhism. In our case, not in everybody's case, Buddhism is not for everyone. But in our case, we have Buddhism that gives us a discipline. And that's exactly what it is. Spiritual practice should be a discipline. It gives us a discipline in order to help us transform our mind. And transforming our mind is very nice. If you talk to anybody on the street, if you say what religion is about, they say it's about being a good person, one. And I'm a good person, one. But a definition of a good person who has studied religious practice and a person who has not studied is very, very different. A good person is very, very different.